So I'm going to try and present reasons for promoting the utility of philosophy to computer science and including applied computer science, so com computer programming, computer use in general. I'm going to argue that all of these areas can profit from some sort of philosophical background. Now in one sense this is trivial. First order logic was invented by a mathematician who was very interested in philosophy and who published primarily in philosophy by the name of Frege and by philosophers like Russell and Whitehead and even Turing published in philosophy and Gödel was very interested in philosophy and without Frege, Russell, Whitehead and so forth we wouldn't have first order logic and without first order logic we, couldn't, we wouldn't have computers because all of the languages of computers rest one way or another on first order logic. So the languages used in ontology, namely description logic such as OWL, are simply fragments of first order logic. Another theme which is in the background of what I want to say today is the idea that philosophy repeatedly has led to important developments in the history of science. The first works in physics and in biology were written or created by philosophers so Aristotle didn't actually publish any books but he gave lectures and his lecture notes were then converted into books by his students and these books some of them are about biology and about physics in a recognizably modern sense or about psychology indeed and so there are other examples of such um, transitions now, the difference between modern science and science in Aristotle's time was that in Aristotle's time, all of science could be known to one single person, namely Aristotle himself. And that's not true anymore. In fact, probably no science today is such that even a decent fraction of what is to be known could be contained inside one person's head because science has become an information-driven enterprise in virtue of the computer. There are multiple sciences. Aristotle didn't have a problem of the unity of science, so he could make sure that his biology was consistent with his physics and that both of them were consistent with his ontology because he was doing it all inside a single mind. And so he could check for consistency as he was going along. But today there is a problem of the unity of science. It's very hard to check consistency between even one branch of physics and another branch of physics. Quantum mechanics and relativity theory have problems in regard to consistency. But during the uh, 18th, 19th century, another way of accounting for the unity of science evolved, which basically said the way we get the unity of science is to make all of science rest upon our experience of reality. And assuming that there is only one reality, then if we rest all our science on experience of reality, then science will be a single, consistent, unitary edifice. If you disagree, then you look at reality. You look under the stone to see how things really are. And this idea is still alive today in physics, as it is alive also in chemistry and biology. The problem is that it doesn't solve the issue of the unity of science anymore because sciences are working for instance on different levels of granularity. Some of them are working on the microphysical level, some on the molecular level, some on the cellular level, some on the single person level, some on the population level, some on the level of the whole galaxy or the cosmos. And it's hard to think of experiments which would resolve inconsistencies between assertions about phenomena on those different levels. Moreover, it's hard to see how we could even check whether there were consistency or inconsistency uh, because they seem to be about quite different things. Now, one step in the direction of the first real attempt to crack this problem of the unity of science was made by Bolzano. So many people talk about the history of European philosophy and they talk about, I mean continental European philosophy. They talk about Descartes and Leibniz and Kant and Hegel and 
and so forth. They very rarely talk about Bolzano, but Bolzano was almost certainly at, at least at the same level as Kant when it comes to the brilliance and originality of his philosophical thinking and the logical rigor and even the influence of his philosophical thinking. Not so much on philosophy in the traditional sense, but on logic. Balzano, for instance, through the Polish school of logic, not just Tarski, but also other people working at the same time as Tarski, who invented things like modern formal semantics. Uh, Balzano's ideas played a big role in the development of modern logic as we know it today. Balzano's main work, uh, he wrote many, many works, some in mathematics, some in more religious topics, and some in philosophy of logic, um, which is what his uh, main contribution to philosophy is about. It's called the theory of science, and in it he defines what a science is, and he says that you can identify a science with an ideal textbook. So there's a question about what we mean by ideal here, but we know what a textbook is. It's a collection of sentences with diagrams and graphs, I suppose, but we can imagine that diagrams and graphs could be converted into sentences. If it's ideal, then those sentences are going to be replaced with propositions. And conceiving the idea of proposition as an idealized sentence, Bolzano was already making a contribution to the way we think about logic today. For Bolzano, we have the first clear statement of the idea, first of all, that there is a problem of the unity of science, because the empiricists just assumed that empirical investigation would solve contradictions between different scientific views. What Bolzano saw was that there was a problem and that there was a solution which would lie in logic. If you're dealing with a large mass of propositions, then you can work out whether the propositions are consistent. So we have the idea of a consistency of a set of propositions. Bolzano influenced primarily philosophers in Austria. Bohemia, the capital of which was Prague, which is where Bolzano lived, was in Austria. And his influence was primarily in places like Vienna. And Brentano and his students were influenced in multiple ways, some of, some of them negative in the sense that they reacted against Bolzano, in part because a Bolzano textbook, or a Bolzano-inspired textbook of logic written by one of his pupils, Robert Zimmermann, although some people believe that it was written by Bolzano, who had religious problems and so couldn't necessarily put his name on his works. Uh, this textbook of logic was read by people like Twardowski, who was one of the initiators of the Polish school of logic, as a school textbook, because they learned logic in school. And one of the ways in which Austria um, influenced modern philosophy is through the development in Vienna in the 1920s and 30s by something called the Vienna Circle of a movement called logical positivism. Logical positivism takes up the Bolzanian idea. It says, well, science is a load of textbooks. These textbooks contain sentences. The sentences, when treated of by logic, become propositions. Now, the propositions are associated with sensory or empirical evidence in virtue of which we can test that they're true or false. By using empirical evidence to formulate and test scientific propositions, and by using logic to create a single unitary collection of propositions expanding or extending across the whole of science, we can thereby check the unity of science or create the unity of science. Now today we have another problem. Science does not consist just of textbooks. Science consists of databases and it consists of algorithms which are used to mine these databases. And it consists of more databases all the time including databases of literature as well as, data, as, well as databases of data. And so the problem of the unity of science has changed yet again. Now, the Vienna Circle had a scheme for solving the problem of the unity of science. Their scheme failed. It worked quite well in mathematics, and that was the model that they took. Mathematics was unified by Whitehead and Russell using Frege's lo ideas on logic. But when they tried to extend it to biology, they 
that they did do work which was very impressive in the sense that it was 50 years or more ahead of its time but it didn't work that no one used it no one could understand it no one could extend it to new discoveries of biology and so it remained a kind of island one or two books and papers in biology you have another island of papers and books in physics approached using these same tools all right so now instead of having textbooks we have new disciplines spawned by the existence of new kinds of data so it's not merely that we have textbooks plus data it's that we have the data creating sciences which are remember idealized textbooks but now they're no longer really comparable to textbooks now they are monsters made out of text to some degree and then out of data to a much larger degree and this in biology anyway was the result of the not just of the human genome project but of the hundreds and hundreds of other genome projects for other kinds of organisms and for other kinds of entities so now you can, um, you can uh, apply genomics instruments not just to organisms and to parts of organisms such as cells and tumors and, and so forth. You can also apply these instruments to the inside of your shoe or to an airplane seat or to, the, to sample cubes of water in the oceans to see what the oceans actually contain in the way of microorganisms. It's not clear how philosophy can help in bringing about the unity of science or in carrying out due diligence to create a consistency of science of the sort that the Vienna Circle and before them Bolzano strove to achieve. We have not merely a scientific problem, we also have a communication problem because all of these new disciplines have an impact on the way we understand human disease and on the way we understand data about people and other organisms actually who have diseases. Everyone believes who works in the medical world that the new omics disciplines are going to transform medicine so the idea is that you will, be, you will have a complete genome created for you as you walk through the door of the hospital and that genome will then serve as the back chain for all the data collected about you about your symptoms and your family and so on but we just don't have the, uh, the, the policies and the, the people and the understanding which would be needed in order to bring about an integration of data between all of these different levels. And this is, these are just some of the data that would have to be integrated and which at the, mo at the moment is dispersed, not just geographically, but also from the point of view of the formats used to describe it. This is not just a theoretical problem as it was for Bolzano and the Vienna Circle. It's a practical problem. And it's primarily a problem of computer science, but computer science involves people. If you can solve a problem theoretically in computer science, that does not mean that your theoretical solution will actually bring about practical benefits. They, these are computer scientists or computer science students who've now graduated and they now work in a hospital or in some kind of big biomedical research center. And they say, all you need to do is unify the data, create one big database put all your data into this one big database and then database engineers will be able to unify and this it precisely illustrates the problem of communication the fact that it's all in the same database doesn't mean that you can find it nor does it mean that you can ingest new data into the database so one characteristic problem of this big database idea is the problem of what is called ingestion the data becomes so big that you don't know where to put new data. You don't know who's responsible for putting new data where it should go. You don't know very much at all beyond a certain point with, within a large enterprise like a large hospital system. Then they say, well, to solve this problem, what you need is an information model or a data model or an information architecture. The information architecture is going to tell you how to ingest data, where to find data, how to handle data while it's in the um, machines, and this will solve the problem, not just of the unity of science, but also of the communication between different disciplines and authorities, regulations, and so forth. This is from 2005. Things have got only slightly better since 2005. 
and nearly everything I say about HL7 still applies. So th this is a long story. I spent many years of my life talking about HL7. I haven't done it for some time. HL7, I strongly believe, is going away, but it's, it survives in all kinds of ways which still are a hindrance. I should say a little bit about HL7 before we talk about the reference information model. So HL7 stands for Health Level 7. This is Level 7 in a hierarchy which goes from physical data actually inside the machine up to textual interaction between people or between the th thoughts that people have or the categories that people use to describe the world. And so they're interested in something which is neutral as between different computer systems, machines, programs, algorithms. They just want to have messages which are sent around between different parts of the hospital enterprise, the labs, the, the wards, the doctors, the research and so forth. They want it all to be captured in a messaging standard. And you can think of it as being analogous to the Roger Wilco walkie-talkie language of old. So everyone knows what Roger means. Everyone knows what Wilco means. That's what HL7 is trying to do. That they want to increase precision of data. They want to make sure that if I send some data with a certain meaning, then you will receive the data, exactly the same data, and understand it in a certain way. And if you look at this page here, they're still doing it in 2018. Nowadays, many people would describe it as an ontology. They, it certainly wasn't conceived as an ontology. It was conceived as a messaging standard. But the HL7 RIM part of this messaging standard, it, some would conceive as an ontology. Everything in medicine is supposed to be capturable within HL7 RIM. So HL7 RIM has a gigantic scope the problem is that this gigantic scope is addressed from a very narrow starting point, which is the needs of the hospital enterprise, including billing and so forth. And I compare it here to thinking that you could do thermodynamics by using airplane English, pilot's English. Pilot's English is a wonderful messaging standard, but you can't apply it to everything. All right, now let's just see how HL7 RIM works. So. They want all the terms to have definitions, which is good, but they don't know how to write definitions, and so they create nonsense. So this first definition is of animal is worse than circuit, and the second one is even worse. Now the reason why they have that alive or not is because patients die, and they want the same patient to be still referenceable once it's dead, but they should not have called that thing a living subject and that that definition of animal is not going to be very helpful once we start doing biology one of the things which HL7 does or did when it was still in its heyday was was it had a big marketing department and they used the um, Katrina floods as, a, as part of an advertising campaign they said you all need to use HL7 rim rim no, HL7 with the rim because then your medical data will be secure and all of these poor survivors don't have their medical data because they didn't use the HL7. The problem is that all these legal documents disappeared in the flood. So all those people who, <laughs> who were supposed to be representable through one or more legal documents were no longer people by this definition because their documents were all destroyed. Now again, that's worse than circular. It's also bad English. And one of the characteristics of the HL7 history is that it's, it's, list, it's existed for many years, and they have a habit of never correcting grammatical errors. They just use copy and paste in each new successive version. Living subject representing. Uh, yes, so that's being, another characteristic of, of information one. models. Yeah. They don't tell you what something actually is. They tell you the something, namely the class or category or type or term or node or whatever it might be, that represents that thing. You have living subject represents single human being. And so they're so, referencing like their category of li yeah. living so subject? Is a, this is something like a code. This code living subject representing a single human being. And so is living subject now a code or is it a real human being? The fact that a person is a living subject suggests that it's a, li it's a real human being. The fact that this string here 
just represents a single human being suggests that this is a mere code. Yeah. So living subject here is a code. So the person code is the living subject code. Or the person code is, is the a living special subject. kind of living subject code, namely it's that kind of living subject that represents. That's but right. now there's a problem because they want to say things like drug treats disease. Now drug is a code. Yeah. Disease is a code. But treats, that sounds like treats. Mm -hmm. And codes don't treat anything. And so all the relations are relations which stand in between real entities. But the entities are not entities in reality, they're codes. And so th they really do speak nonsense, but this is an information model. And so you're not allowed to say, that sounds like nonsense to me, because you just hear drug treats disease. That sounds like good English. When you unpack it, you realize that it says drug code treats disease code. And the way they get away with it is by never writing out this code part. It comes in only by, because of the way they use representing. Not absolutely consistently, but, but almost consistently. You can, you, can, you can trap them. What happens when you trap them is that they sometimes correct the definition. Mm. But then they don't change the old definition. They just add the new definition at the end of the list. And th this means that people who know how to use HL7 can get paid <laughs> because it's really complicated to manage this. Uh. So living subject, they say, is a subtype of entity. And the definition of entity now is not something that represents a physical thing. This, this is just literally what they say. A physical thing, group of physical things, or an organization capable of participating in acts while in a role. They don't get the grammar or the syntax of this clear, because it's not clear whether they, whether the, what the scope of capable of participating in acts while in a role is. Or indeed, what the scope of while in a role is. Does while in a role refer to everything which comes before, or just to organizations? So, but what they mean is that an entity for HL7 RIM is either a physical thing capable of participating in acts while in a role, or a group of th physical things capable of participating in acts while in a role, or an organization capable of participating in acts while in a role. Because HL7 sees the world purely in terms of acts. And to be a, participating in an act you have to be in a role. So you can't be treating anybody unless you're in a role of doctor or nurse. You can't have a disease unless you're in a role of patient, and so on. So uh, the whole world is viewed just through the telescope uh, which, which focuses on what things do in role. They have a state model or a state diagram. So they have many state diagrams indeed. And entities can go through four states now, remember, we're really not talking about entities. We're talking about codes or code in a, in a document or in a database. And we're only talking about those codes which can, as it were, participate in acts while in roles. Entities can either be act, currently active or not currently active. And then normal means the typical state. And it excludes nullified, which is the termination state, when an entity instance was created in error. It's the state which an entity is in when there is no entity. Now, this is nonsense on stilts. You see, it means that there are two ways of dying in an HL7 hospital. One is that you just die, which is an act. And the other is that you're deleted from the database. Person doesn't refer to persons, it refers to objects in information systems, entities created through processes of data entry. So HL7 focuses on documentation of entities which act, or something like that. It's not clear to a normal human being, exactly what. Entities don't undergo processes such as being treated or falling ill or dying. They undergo processes of being revised, reactivated, nullified, and so on. Active doesn't really mean active in the sense that the doctor is walking around the room. It means active in the sense that the document is in the document chain that's relevant to it when he's in this role, something like that, I think. But 
even though persons are not entities, they're not real things, they're not entities in the normal sense of the word, they are entities of the sort which can be created through processes of data entry, it's still the case that persons have postal addresses. So this have holds between real things, but it's used to hold between code things. Code things don't live at postal addresses, but they have postal addresses. So have means something different, just as treats mean something different. But that something different is just something that you are supposed to swallow when you're living in the land of information models. I sometimes like to say that the land of information models is a land where there is no difference between use and mention. So it's true that swimming is healthy, and it's also true that swimming has eight letters. Now, ACT is really interesting. Um, and all, the pu purpose of all of this, I hope, is clear. If HL7 had had a few skeptical philosophers in the room <laughs> when they put this thing together, it would have been at least better. An act is the record of an act. The authors of this would happily, and you can still find these things in the, in the documentation from the early period of HL7. It's about 20 years old now. Um, they would say HL7 RIM is based in speech act theory. And as everyone knows, speech act theory tells us that every act is identical with its own documentation. Literally, they would say that. So, in two different places, you have an act is an action of interest. That just means an action. That has happened, can happen, and so on. Here it says, an act is the record of something that is being done, has been done, can be. Now, these two look like contradictions. They're not. There's no human way of reading them to justify it. They're not being contradictory, but they're not contradictory in the land of HL7. Now, the, the HL7, in spite of all, the, all of this, was very successful. It's, it's compulsory. I think even today it's compulsory for use in all exchange of medical information. Compulsory because the federal government has said it's compulsory. It's a United States federal standard. It's a standard, or it was when I last checked, in 66 different countries. It was used as a central part of a huge program to try and modernize hospitals in England so that they would all use the same electronic record system. The system I, it failed twice and cost $18 billion, or roughly speaking, $18 billion, and th 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 it, never, it never succeeded. Uh, it, 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 it's not even true to say that it's been replaced, it's just been quietly forgotten. Now I'm not saying that HL7 was responsible for this, but there were questions in Parliament. Why did you build a system like this based on HL7? And Tony Blair, who was the uh, forward-looking Prime Minister who wanted everything to be modernized, said, well we were told that HL7 was a US federal government standard and we thought that nothing could go wrong. So that's what went wrong. So I started a blog and for several years I posted diligently examples of the phenomena I've been describing. So one illustration is how because they have so many superficially conflicting definitions, you never know what any given word means, but there are ex experts who do know and who are willing to teach you over long, long exchanges by email. They relied on the use of email fora in order to disseminate the correct reading of these various different definitions. And I had friends in the HL7 world who would send me particularly humiliating examples of these enormously tortuous uh, attempts to explain what the real reading for an HL7 expert might be for a given term. And I put them on my blog. But the, the nicest example on my blog is this entry here. So it's a, um, a dialogue between Werner Koisters whom you know, and somebody called Dan Russler, who was at that time a leader in the HL7 field. And I'll just summarize the dialogue very quickly. It's about how you model or represent or capture in a database the weight of the baby. And Werner says that you need to have the date when the weight is carried out. You need to have the value of the weight. You're going to have a, a unique ID for the baby. 
So name wouldn't do because some people have the same name. And you probably need the unique ID for the parents and for the nurse who carried out. And Dan Russler in response says, in order to know the weight of the baby, I need to know the weight of the entire universe. And the reason is that weight is a relative term. You only have weight if you have a relation between the weight thing and everything else. And it gets worse from there. There was at one, st one stage uh, an initiative called the Microsoft Health Vault. This, this is several years ago. They, they've got better since then. Health Vault itself was pulled by Microsoft some years ago. But it gives you an I in illustration of the fact that this information modeling disease is not confined to HL7. An allergic episode is defined as an occurrence of an allergy which is defined by the allergy type symptoms. So before there were allergy type dot symptoms in Microsoft Health Vault, there were no allergies. Allergic episode inherits health record item. Now I think what that means is that an allergic episode is not an allergic episode without the italic. It's a health record item. That's what they mean by allergic episode. Nothing could be clearer than that. And then they say a health record item is a single piece of data in a health record accessible to the Microsoft Health Vault service. Boy. So in other words, nobody else has health record items, only Microsoft. <laughs> so this, there are no insurance claims unless they're in the Microsoft Health Vault. There are no exercise session records unless they're in the Microsoft Health Vault and so on. So again, this is the use mentioned confusion. Ordinary people should not try and make this work. Now another example, it goes back to the early years of ontology in the sense in which you and I understand it. Uh, it's something called Ontology Development 101, uh, created by Natalia Noy and Deborah McGuinness. Now, both of them are very successful and, and very brilliant people, but this ontology development guide is not good. It has not weathered well since the time it was created, which is in 2001. Very little in the way of computationally useful ontologies from that period have survived. I'll see if I can show you what's wrong with it, or some of the things which are wrong with it. Uh, so this is the, the idea. You can create ontologies, and they're providing the training materials to, to help you create ontologies. And Natasha was re responsible for many important software innovations in the ontology realm, and she was one of the leading architects of the BioPortal, which is a, a very good place to search ontologies and find ontologies, and indeed to post ontologies. It, it, it's confined to the biomedical arena, but it's still an amazing resource. They make a distinction between an ontology and a knowledge base. Basically, you get a knowledge base by adding instance information to the general t terminologically focused information in the ontology. I agree with that. What I don't agree with is what comes next. They say, wh what they, they say is probably true, but what they mean is there is no line because some things can be instances in one context and general types in other contexts. And I think this is, philosophically speaking, this has got to be wrong. And it, when we look at what they do, you will see that it is indeed wrong. So, classes is their word for these generals as contrasted with particulars. So, classes describe context. So, classes are kind of word things rather than real things. But we can, we can live with that. It's not clear that concepts are in the domain or in people's heads or somewhere else indeed, but we can live with that too. So a class of wines represents all wine. The class wine, let's say, just to make it clear, is a code kind of thing which represents all wines, that's fine. And then specific wines are instances of this codey kind of thing. And the specific wine would be Bordeaux wine. Bordeaux wine is a wine. Every instance of Bordeaux wine is a wine. Okay, so this instance of Bordeaux wine in the glass in front of me, is it a wine? It's not. It's an instance of portion of wine. Bordeaux wine is not a portion of wine. Bordeaux wine is a kind of wine. So the kind wine is at the top 
and then the kind Bordeaux wine is a kind which is a subkind of the kind wine. Wine in this glass in front of me is not an instance of the kind wine or an instance of the kind Bordeaux wine, it's an instance of the kind portion of wine. It's also an instance of the kind portion of Bordeaux wine. This is what an early version of Protégé said about instances. I don't think anyone thinks like that anymore. This is from Ontology 101. The thing is, it's really easy to create wine. You just create an instance in your database. So we can create an individual instance, Chateau Morgan Beaujolais. What that means is you enter a term into your ontology. That's what they mean by create an instance. This instance represents a specific type of Beaujolais wine. They're using the word type now, which is a kind of progress. Chateau Morgan Beaujolais is an instance of the class Beaujolais. Now they bring the concept word back in again. To decide whether a particular concept is a class or an instance depends on what the potential applications of the ontology are. Now this is a common theme. Again, it's gone away, but when I was growing up in the ontology world, working with Natasha and her friends in Stanford, it was very common to say, well, how you build your ontology depends upon your intended use, and if different people have different intended uses, even if your ontology is really good for your use, they may need to create a completely different ontology because they have a different use. And the result is that you have too many ontologies and so ontologies become useless. This is part of the same symptom of thinking that ontology use determines what the ontology structure should be. If we're only going to talk about pairing wine with food, we're not interested in specific bottles. We're only interested in kinds of wine, specific wines, produced by specific wineries, specific kinds of wine, in other words, produced, for instance, by wines in Beaujolais. But if we want to maintain an inventory of wines in our restaurant, then we need to keep track of individual bottles. That's fine. Individual bottles may become individual instances and our knowledge base. That's fine, but they're not instances of the kind wine. They're instances, instances of the kind bottle containing wine. The bottles may become instances. That is philosophically nonsense. Nothing can become an instance. Nothing can cease to be an instance and become a class. They say that that is possible because they say it might be a class in one ontology and an instance in another. But then it's a different thing. According to this approach, there are more and less general instances. Some instances are very specific. For instance, this specific instance of Chateau Morgan Beaujolais and other instances are very general. For instance, this instance of wine. But the same instance. It's the kinds that are more or less general. The instances are the same. In this case, they're exactly the same, because it is an instance of Chateau Morgan Beaujolais. If our concepts form a natural hierarchy, then we should represent them as a hierarchy, with more general at the top and less general at the bottom. Wine at the top, Chateau Morgan Beaujolais wine near the bottom. Okay, that's what they say for every natural hierarchy. Now, there is a natural hierarchy which has Europe at the top, and then France, Germany, Switzerland on the next level, and then Bordeaux region, Beaujolais region, Champagne region on the next level, and Chateau Morgan Beaujolais region on the bottom level. So this is a hierarchy. So we should represent it as a hierarchy, which means it has general and specific classes and subclasses. This means that France is a kind of Europe. It means that Beaujolais region is a kind of France. <laughs> it's what they say. Because it's a hierarchy, and all hierarchies should be represented using Isa relations between classes. So the Court d'Or region is a Bourgogne region. So they made it very hard to clearly distinguish which regions are classes and which regions are instances because they confuse classes and instances in the first place. And in order to resolve this confusion, they just define all regions as classes. Even this little one square centimeter of dirt in the middle of the Burgundy region is a class. So this is the Isa hierarchy. France is a kind of Europe. <laughs> the answer to all these questions is yes, sometimes. So if we're recording different properties of specific vintages, then the specific vintage is an instance. Sterling Vineyards Merlot, which has these vintages, is a class. And all the actual vintages are instances. And again, what we would say is that vintage is a kind, and all of the different vintages of any given wine are instances of that kind. 
Now, Alsace has a problem because it crosses between France and Germany. And so it's neither a France nor is it a Germany. It is a Europe. It is a Europe, yeah. <laughs> now, there is a puzzle which I, I tried for a long time to solve when I started working with computer scientists and software engineers. Many of them are quite brilliant. They would embrace quite nonsensical anti-realist philosophical principles. So we've just seen this idea that there are no instances and classes really, it's just a question of the use that we find for an ontology, what we call an instance and what we call a class. Another characteristic feature is that they don't think that there are any truths. Computer scientists are not interested in having data models which represent the world truthfully. They're interested in data models which represent the world usefully. And I would assume that if it's true, it's more likely to be useful than if it's a false representation. So the, the argument that which they would never formulate like this is that it's easier to write software if we use simplification. And we can't know what reality is like anyway because it's out there somewhere and we're software engineers. We're not interested in what we might one day be capable of knowing. We're, all we're interested in is the concepts that we have. They're the only things which we can know. We can only know what's, what's inside our computers or inside our heads. That's the very common idea which undergraduate philosophers arrive in universities believing all too often and which it takes a year or so to cleanse them of. So, painting the emperor's palace is hard. So we won't try to paint the palace. We'll find a simplified model. <laughs> and the result is that you have many, many ontologies, all of which are simplifications. Ontology 101 is just a, a, a recipe for producing simplistic ontologies. And the, each person, as they recommend indeed, creates them in a different way, and so they don't, they don't work well together. And the, the correct approach, in my view, is the exact opposite of that. So, and that correct approach is that we create, constrain ontologies so that they converge. Bad scientific theories die very quickly, and so bad ontologies should also die. And then the question is, what should be the constraint? And the answer is, reality should be the constraint. And how do we know about reality? Well, by doing experimentally based science. So empiricism still plays a role here, but now it's playing a role in determining what terms we should use in our ontologies, namely the terms of established scientific theories. We don't build an ontology to represent codes, we build an ontology to re represent people and beds and diseases and treatments and doctors and so on. So that's ontological realism. You start with the world. BFO, when it was developed, uh, starting in around 2004, was developed in a very scientific context. Nowadays, BFO is being used in all kinds of places which have something to do with science but only indirectly. So administration, government, military, banking and so on. But th this is how things appeared when we first started. So ontologies are like sciences and they, they, they're going to be organized in a hierarchy just as science is, or in multiple hierarchies actually. You have physics, then you have nuclear physics, then you have nuclear atomic physics, um, and th then you have chemistry and you have organic chemistry and then you have organic cell chemistry. And it's similarly we should have well demarcated ontologies and we have BFO at the top. And then all the other ontologies would in principle descend from BFO. These ontologies, because they are wedded to the relevant scientific discoveries, would be maintained by experts in the corresponding sciences, and they would be designed to be used in tandem with each other. So you would build the ontology for cell biology while you're building the ontology for tissue biology or organ biology or uh, molecular biology. And all of those people would know each other, they would know which discoveries they were making were relevant to this area, and so the ontologies themselves would develop terminologically. Remember, we're only talking about terminologies now and definitions. Terminolo terminologically, each ontology would develop in tandem with all the rest. And so you would solve the problem of the unity of science for what it's worth by creating a unified set of terminologies at different levels within this gigantic hierarchy. And everything should be done by the scientists. So they, they formulate the hypotheses, they do the experiments, they create the terminologies. So this is the middle here, connecting the databases and textbooks with what comes before. 
scientists create terminologies. They decide what new terms need to be introduced and they decide what old terms are going to be obsolete. So there is no term phlogiston in science anymore. There is a term SARS, there is a term HIV, and those terms then would get added to the relevant ontologies. But it should be the scientists who are in charge of this, not the, not the computer scientists. And it, it has actually grown since I created these slides. It has, things have developed in that way. Now we have a, an entire um, industry of biologist-created biological databases, which are maintained by people who are not just <coughs> computer scientists, but who are trained in biology and who work with people who are trained in biology. Now, similarly, ontology works in an empirical way. So each science, the idea is, will have some kind of consensus core terminology. And it will be pretty easy to work out what that consensus core is because there are glossaries and, and so forth created by scientists. But it won't be easy in every case. There'll be a penumbra where you're not quite sure how to organize the terminology. There'll be some terms that the ontology will need which are not scientific at all, but they'll come primarily from BFO and from in the information artifact ontology and other top level ontologies. But most of the terms will come from the sciences. The issue will just be to get the right definitions, maximally definitions which reuse terms from other sciences or from other parts of the same science, just simpler ones, higher up the scale. And then you train ontologists who can work with the scientific people, ideally they would themselves be experts in some scientific domain to create the hierarchy and to create the other relations which you need in order to have not just a taxonomy but also partonomy and, and so forth. And then the idea finally would be to have this work of ontology development which is a kind of terminological housekeeping work be a recognized part of the scientific process just as statistics is a recognized part of the scientific process. So a, a grant from the NIH will typically have a statistician involved, a small fraction of the time of the statistician. Some grants now get time written in for an ontologist and the reason is that if you build gigantic databases and you don't know what terminology is being used or if the terminology is built badly, people won't find the data in the database. People won't be able to use the data in the da database as well as they could if you did the ontology part correctly. So now what I'm doing is describing the work of the ontology scientist, not the scientist who's doing ontology, but the person who is doing that science, which is called ontology, which is not part of philosophy anymore. We need methods for evaluating when ontologies are better or worse which changes in ontologies are more to be recommended or less to be recommended and so on. We need to have peer review for ontologies just as we have peer review for scientific papers. And we need to have canonical science or what I think Thomas Kuhn might call normal science. We need to have normal ontologies which have been accredited as being the ontologies which you should use if you're working in a given scientific domain. And that is much less painful than it sounds because remember the ontology is built out of the terms used in the established parts of that domain in the first place. So During the period when the gene ontology was being developed, and the gene ontology is the paradigm normal ontology, many changes have taken place in biology. Many, many, many changes. But the core architecture of the gene ontology is just the same as it was before. The, if you have orthogonality, each domain will be run by experts in that domain and they will have an obligation to ensure that the ontology is, is developed, is maintained as science advances. And this is what we have achieved now in the biological world. And by, by not having ontologies overlap, you eliminate redundancy because the same term should appear only in one ontology at any given level. And this, I think, is part of the basic goal of science. So this physics should be a module, one module. If there are two physics which disagree, then that is a situation which science cannot tolerate. Physics has to be a singular module. Now it can have all kinds of branches, but it can't have sectarian splits. And that's why the problem of the non-consistency of quantum mechanics and relativity theory is it's, it's such a burning problem.
Now, then we come back to the special purposes idea. Um, I think that there is a grain of truth in the special purposes idea. People do need application ontologies. But what I've been talking about so far is reference ontologies. These are ontologies which are built by scientific experts for reuse by other scientists. Application ontologies are built for local projects, clinical trials, for instance. Having one ontology which everyone on this level of reference ontologies is, is basically required to use or obliged to use or encouraged to use will bring about certain pain points because the ontology will create terminology which one subgroup may not like. We can solve those pain points by having synonyms. But there will be corners cut. So BFO says that everything is either an, a continuant or an occurrent. And some people think that waves are both. And BFO forces you to make a decision or to have two words for wave. Yeah. And that is going to be problematic. Now, if it becomes so problematic for a given region of science, then we will just have to change BFO. We haven't reached that point yet. So BFO is an empirical project. It's not a, a, a priori project. But having vetted normal ontologies means that we avoid what is the worst of all problems in the current age of data-driven science, which is creation of silos. It helps us to avoid silos because we are constraining the choices that people have in terminological description.